The show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up in today's show, how do you turn a tree into 2,000 handy wooden hangers? Hang around and we'll have you hooked. Instant soup serves up a hearty cup in seconds. We lift the lid on the process that makes this magic powder. And we'll reveal the revolution in the clothing industry that's making a walk outdoors comfortable come rain or shine. But first, the drive home after work is miserable when it's raining, but the invention of the windscreen wiper has helped provide a clear view ahead for many car drivers. The modern windscreen wiper is made of two key parts. First, the arm that holds the wiper blade, and second, the flexible rubber blade itself. Wiper blade production begins with this bizarre looking material. This strange and lumpy substance is rubber in its raw form. Synthetic rubber is available, but this factory uses the natural variety, made with sap harvested from rubber trees grown in Malaysia. First, the raw rubber needs to be rolled out. The aim is to completely remove all the air bubbles from the substance, which can take a little time. After about 30 minutes, it looks more like this, smoother and, well, more rubbery. Next, one of the most important elements of wiper blade rubber can be added, carbon black powder. This gives the rubber its traditional black hue and strengthens it to help it resist the elements. The rubber has been rolled out and now rolls off the conveyor into the mixing machine, where the carbon black powder will be added. What emerges from the mixer looks a lot more like the traditional rubber that we would recognize. So we've got the rubber for the blades, but there's more to wipers than just that. The next step is to build the arms that will hold them and carry them back and forth across your windscreen. They're made using this sheet steel. It's fed into this press, which is very accurate and wastes very little metal from the roll. The press can produce over 900,000 arms every day. The shaved arms are still attached to the band of raw steel. They are left like this for now as it makes them easier to transport through the next few stages of the production process. The wiper's job is to clear your windscreen. This means they'll be exposed to all of the worst weather, so they'll need excellent corrosion protection. This device is used to paint the arms. The particles are electrostatically charged using 80,000 volts. The water curtain keeps the painting area isolated by filtering excess paint out of the air. The arms are sent to dry and the process of turning the fresh rubber into wiper blades can now begin. First, the raw material is squeezed into the extruder. This forces it into the right shape to make a continual band that when cut in half will form two separate wiper blades. Now, like this, there will be very long wiper blades, but this is only the beginning of the process. Next, the long band is passed through a hot salt bath, which toughens up the rubber. And now the band is cut to size. This factory produces wiper blades for a wide range of vehicles, all of which need different model windscreen wipers. 
With the blades cut to the right length, the two parts can now be separated. A spinning guillotine splits the band in half perfectly. And the result is a fresh wiper blade. To make sure the rubber quality is high, samples are taken from each batch and run through rigorous tests. Here, dirty water is sprayed on a mock windscreen and the wiper's ability to clear it is monitored. This nozzle is blasting snow at the car in a wind tunnel at minus 30 degrees Celsius. Each wiper has to survive 24 hours in these conditions, non-stop. If they can't clear the snow or they jam for any reason, they fail. The engineers use this time to assess the design of the wiper blade arm as well as the unit's performance. When they're satisfied the blades and arms are up to the task, the engineers will start assembling them. This is an important but repetitive part of the job in the wiper factory. Her task is to feed fresh blades into the machine so they can be joined together with the arms. The robotic carrier will slide the holders over the blades and clamp them into place. The new units are then sent past a camera linked to a quality control computer. Human eyes are also used to check each new set of wipers that emerge from the machine. As well as removing all the dirt and muck that are sprayed onto a windscreen, the wiper must also cope with bigger objects like dead leaves in the autumn. Then there's excessive dirt from a muddy excursion. Manufacturers recommend that you clean your wipers now and then, as this will prolong their lifespan. And a squirt of window wash will keep your view clear, whatever the weather. When you pop out in the winter, you always take your jacket, but you also always leave something behind. It's a simple device, but a lot of work goes into the ordinary wooden coat hanger. The handy wooden hanger keeps clothes off the floor and helps keep them more or less crease-free. Their life starts out here at a sawmill. A log this size could probably produce around 2,000. Beech wood is useful for two reasons. Firstly, the wood is a hardwood timber with short fibres which gives it strength and secondly, it doesn't produce excessive sap and that makes the wood easier to work with. Once the planks have been cut, the carpenter swings each length around to another table where he can cut it down to a more manageable size. For a good hanger, the bark definitely has to go. The next step is to shape these square panels of the raw wood. The carpenter passes the block back and forth across this curved saw. Like slicing a ham at the butcher's, he slices off a fresh curve of wood each time. But this is only the beginning. Next, the banana-shaped wood slices are fed into this machine. Here, they will be given some of the more familiar features of the coat hanger. First, some of the rough edges are removed. Next, the indentations which will help hang spaghetti strap dresses are carved into the tops. You may have noticed that these hangers are looking a little on the large side. Well, you'd be right. This next machine produces several smaller slices from each chunk. A quick 
shake to remove the sawdust and one thick hanger has now become five normal sized ones. These are then stacked up in this special formation. The freshly cut wood needs to dry, but not too quickly or it would warp. This slow drying process takes about two weeks. The traditional shape of a familiar hanger is slowly emerging, but at this stage the material is still quite rough. This machine sands them down. As each new one is passed along the sanders, it knocks the finished one in front into the waiting bin below. So far, the hanger factory has produced nice smooth curves of wood, but if they are going to hang your coat up, they're going to need a hook. Holes are drilled into the wood and each worker can prepare about 400 an hour. With the holes complete, they're ready to be hooked up, but not yet. First, this carpenter is adding them to one of these frames. They need to sit securely, so he hammers them into place. Their destination? A varnish bath. The hangers will be handled on a daily basis in whichever cupboard becomes their new home. The varnish coat will make them more robust. When they're removed, any drips are brushed off and the hangers are left for 12 hours to dry. Using this system, the carpenter can coat over 3,000 new hangers every day. So, are they ready for their new hoop now? Well, actually, no. First, a support bar must be added. This will be nailed into place along the bottom. The most important task for this bar is to hold up the trousers that go with a suit, for example. And finally, the hangers are ready to get their hook. The worker will select one hook and one fresh hanger. They are placed in here and the machine does the rest. So from a single beech log, this production plant can turn all that wood into over 2,000 handy hangers to store your clothes. Still to come, each one of these packets contains a mug of hot soup. Join us as we add up all the ingredients for a hot cup of chicken noodle and Gore-Tex jackets have transformed the outdoor clothing industry. We'll show you the secrets behind this marvellous material. A warming bowl of noodle soup. The traditional soup is full of healthy vegetables, herbs and lots of flavour. But there's one drawback. All that chopping and reducing and cooking do take time. But this may help to explain the popularity of all the instant soups available on the market today. Life for many of the ingredients in an instant soup starts out in trucks and believe it or not, this one is full of sugar. Soup producers use sugar in many of their recipes because it adds flavour to the final taste. These workers are sorting another important ingredient, dried leeks. Any burnt ones are removed, but the rest will be added to the final mixture. And this is where the meatballs are made. All different parts of the cow are used from the haunch to the throat. Its first stop is the mincer. Once it's all ground down to a basic consistency, it's added into an industrial mixer. Other key ingredients are added, dried egg white powder, breadcrumbs and spices. Together they help bind everything to make the meatballs for the soup. The whole mixture is then passed down through this cylinder and into the meatball machine. The little balls that emerge from the bottom are sprinkled with flour and shaken so they don't all stick together. Hundreds of racks of fresh meat balls are then placed into a large drying oven where they will spend about two hours. 
With all the ingredients prepared, now it's time to mix them into the right combinations for the various soup varieties. Here the dried leek is being added. The cart it's fed into is a large set of scales on wheels. This helps the worker to measure the right amount of each ingredient. As well as dried vegetables, he will also include spices such as paprika, salt and pepper and garlic powder. And there's one other ingredient that always helps enhance the flavour, and that's fat. It starts out as liquid, but to get it into the soup it has to be solidified. The liquid fat is cooled to minus 14 degrees Celsius. That way it can be chipped into little flakes. If the cooks poured liquid fat into the mixing bowl, it wouldn't disperse evenly. The whole mix is then sent to these big blenders where the ingredients are thoroughly combined. Instant soup production is a massive industry in the UK. There are about 10 major companies that produce it and the industry is worth over £73 million every year. Competition is fierce, so leading soup makers also employ taste testers to keep their profitable business on the boil. The feedback from these testers will determine which new flavours are deemed good enough to make it to the supermarket shelves. Back on the production line, the soup is ready to be packed up. But what happened to the meatballs? Well, this machine is taking care of them. They're fed down into the hoppers that will distribute a specific weight of meatballs into every packet. As they fall, they're combined with the soup powder and the noodles, which are also being added to the packets below. The final machine in this part of the production line seals the top of the packets with these heated grips and the soup is ready to go. Each packet is loaded into a box containing the same flavour and these boxes are then shipped around the production plant to the storage facility. With a huge variety of flavours on the market, from chicken noodle soup to minestrone, workers make sure that the different varieties are boxed separately. One company claims that more than 250 million mugs of its famous instant soup are consumed every year. It's an intensive industrial process that tempts consumers to turn on the kettle and cook up a hot cup of soup. When it comes to outdoor clothing, Gore-Tex is probably one of the most useful inventions today. First manufactured in 1978, it's lightweight, it provides good protection and keeps the wearer warm. So how does this simple fabric manage to do so much? Gore-Tex clothing is made using two layers of material. The outer layer is often nylon or polyester combined with a Gore-Tex membrane beneath. This membrane has over 1.4 billion pores per square centimetre. They're too small for rain to come in, but large enough to let steam or sweat vapours out. The first step is fashion, and a designer creates a template from which to cut the cloth. This software helps cut the material as efficiently as possible to avoid waste. And whilst the designer is drawing up the plans for the new jacket, her assistant is down in the warehouse selecting the right shade of material for the outer layer. The designer, meanwhile, is printing up her cloth template ready for the cutting process. With the cloth and the template together, the seamstress can cut out the different pieces required to make a jacket. The template is clipped into place and this provides the cutter with a guide for shaping the cloth beneath. With everything cut to size, the tailoring work can now begin. 
There are over 200 parts in total, but it's not all material. There are plenty of zips, buttons and toggles too. Slowly, the different pieces come together, including the Gore-Tex membrane. Although that is the real working part of this jacket, it's important the outer layer can withstand the kind of conditions it will face. The first test seen here is for abrasion. Long-term wear and tear is something any outdoor jacket will have to resist. This device rubs the material against a rough surface. Each rub is the same as about 12 hours of wear. Each piece of cloth must endure at least 87,000 rubs. Light damage means this material appears to have passed and should remain waterproof. As well as abrasion, the material's strength is also tested. A cloth sample is loaded into a machine that will stretch it to breaking point. The force required to tear it is then measured to assess the material's quality. Meanwhile, the finishing touches are being added to the jacket. One problem with sewing Gore-Tex is the stitching. Water can get in through these holes, which are huge compared to the material's microscopic pores. However, a liner is heated into place, which seals the stitching. First developed in the late 70s by Mr. Gore, the material with the unique one-way breathing system has the added bonus of being lightweight. But how can they test if it's waterproof? They use pressure. If water seeps through the fabric, it means the material offers no protection against rain, and the wearer would end up cold and wet in a storm. This is clearly a fail. But when the Gore-Tex fabric is exposed to the same test, although the force applied to both samples is the same, the difference is clear. Even when bulging under the pressure, the Gore-Tex remains watertight. The jacket is now almost complete. It only needs a few extras. Buttons are a helpful addition. The jacket may be waterproof, but if it's not done up, it won't offer much protection. Finally, quality control examiners run one last test. By pumping the jacket full of air, they can check that the seams are secure. When the work's done, this jacket will resist the elements, keeping the dedicated rambler dry on the inside, even when the weather is at its worst on the outside. <laughs>